You talked a lot about sort of what was happening um, for you outside of school, but talk a little bit what was actually happening in school, in your classrooms. How was school leadership mm -hmm. um, responding to you? What was what did that feel like and look like? Yeah, so it's interesting. I uh, it makes me think of when I was in elementary school. I remember I used to go to a counselor and we'd work on skills and it'd be a small group and you know it made me feel good and I'd go back to class you know ready to learn and uh, when I was in high school it was very different um, I remember going to my counselor and it was strictly focusing on grades so it's what classes are you taking what classes are you in now and I remember my mom having to advocate because my counselor was trying to put me in remedial classes and so my counselor would ask why, or my mom would ask, why are you putting him in these classes? And she said, well, you know, just based off the way things have been, we think it would be better, you know, less challenges, he can focus on getting himself together. And had it not been for my mom advocating, I would have been in those classes that didn't, wouldn't have prepared me for any type of, you know, collegiate success. And then also feeling like just being a number, because I could check a box on a quota, we have him in this program, he fits this minority category, great. And so, I think inside the school, I wasn't receiving that support because it was like, you're in this program, you should be good, you don't need any support, handle it on your own. Right. And so talk more to Jamal about sort of what different, different leaders in your school, what roles they played, so teachers versus principal. So you talked about the fact that you didn't feel like you had an advocate. Yeah. And even the guidance counselor wasn't playing that role. Did you have you know, any other folks um, working with you that sort of sort of had your back? Yeah, I remember uh, Carlos Grant. He was an assistant um, principal at the school. And I remember one morning I just was having a bad day and did not want to go to school. And my mom called Mr. Grant and he drove to my house <laughs> and wow. knocked on my bedroom door and made me get up and wow. get dressed. Uh, you know, took me for breakfast and then we went to school. And um, that was very impressional for me because that was the first time I felt uh, valuable in that school because mm -hmm. they had told me, oh, you know, you can succeed, you can do great, you'll be fine, but it was never reinforced through action. And so Mr. Grant, um, you know, as a minority male himself, was really able to tell me, like, this is important, you need to do this, and really just change that structure. And because of his role in the school, I felt that value because mm -hmm. the principal, you know, was doing, you know, administrative duties principal and whatnot. Thanks. Right, exactly. <laughs> so having Mr. Grant um, really changed that. And even more, he advocated to my teachers, which mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of young people get. Uh, as many times as I got in trouble, he saved me from, I can imagine how many, by just saying, hey, listen, Jamal's having a bad day. Be patient. I promise it'll get better tomorrow. Right. And it did. But had he not stepped in and had that conversation, I would have never been given the opportunity. Yeah, so we hear a lot about that, um, that, that notion that you, there needs to be someone that has a, you have a connection to yeah. in your school and that without that, um, you, you go looking for it other places. Is that yeah. sort of, oh, definitely. can you relate to that? Definitely, yeah. I think that's why initially I got in as much trouble as I did because I wasn't a bad kid. And you know, I think a lot of times we judge youth for the mistakes of adolescence. Mm -hmm. You know, I was growing up, I was still learning who I am and trying to understand all that. Um, but having that connection with uh, Mr. Grant really connected me to the school. Right. Pushing those boundaries, you were. <laughs> yes. We all have had children who've done that to <laughs> us. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm supposed to also remind you all here in the audience and those listening online that if you want to submit a question for Jamal, you do that through the Slido app that we just um, used in the poll. So please take advantage of that. Um, what Jamal, let's turn to, you mentioned at the end of your talk this, this notion of policy, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of policy people here in the room. What policies do you think um, sort of contributed to the experience that you had? And after that, I'm going to ask you to talk to this room about, you know, what, what could we change? So talk about what policy um, issues you felt like you ran up against. Yeah, definitely, by far, it was zero tolerance. It was this firm stance on there are no exceptions to the rules. Everyone will be treated differently. I don't care how exceptional or unexceptional you may be, but this is how we deal with people who have this label that you do. And so for me, um, when I was 
uh, arrested my second time, it wasn't an incident related to the school. I had never gotten in trouble at school, uh, but because of the charges, my school expelled me. I hadn't even gone before a judge yet. I didn't even know I had been in trouble yet. I hadn't mm -hmm. spoken to any law enforcement officials. And so what that did was railroad me and I had to go to uh, an opportunity school where um, it's really, it was a daycare. It was us sitting in a room watching movies all day, completing worksheets and going home at the end of the day. And then even more, um, having that label influenced how teachers perceived me in my new school mm -hmm. and having to overcome that. And so a lot of what I ran into is that. But then also even um, in the criminal justice system, uh, my last time in jail, I was a senior in high school. I had maybe a month and a half until graduation. But uh, because I was 18, they said I had to get a GED. And I, I just... I couldn't understand. I was like, I'm a senior in high school. Why right. would I get a GED? Right. Like, I'm about to graduate. Um, and so just a lot of those policies um, not being super stiff and non-flexible limited my options for how I could improve myself. Hmm. So it didn't matter what your circumstances were. There was, there was a policy on paper, and that was what was happening. Yeah, and the crazy part, um, in Charlotte we have these things, uh, and of course testing. I would, and it's uh, ranked on a scale of one being the lowest, four being the highest. I would score fours on my EOCs, but fail the class because I had an excess of 60 to 90 absences. So from an academic standpoint, I had mastered the curriculum I was supposed to at grade level, but due to absences, they said, you have to repeat the course. And was there anyone in the school, Jamal, who was connecting those dots, who was actually looking at, at your situation across all those data points or were they just people were acting based on data points that were isolated? Yeah, and we actually have our executive director from Charlotte here, Molly Shaw. It was communities and schools of Charlotte. It wasn't until... I didn't even know that was going to be his answer to that question. I just want everyone to know that. <laughs> Um, sorry. No, no, you're fine, you're fine. Um, but it was Joe Rothenberg who was like, what the heck is going on with this kid? And who finally put those pieces together and helped me. But my guidance counselors didn't see it. You know, Mr. Grant was helping me, but he had, you know, assistant principal duties he had to do. What my teachers weren't noticing it. And it wasn't until I connected with Joe in our first conversation. He was like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And that was really like the first time someone had asked me that question. It's interesting because we, um, in the work that we do at Conservative Leaders for Education, we have a few of our um, in-state um, legislative leaders who are actually looking at some of these issues um, to the panel that we saw earlier, this notion of um, why are there more security guards than there are counselors? Well, th that's somewhat of an overreaction to school violence, you know, mass school violence. Um, uh, incidents and so um, tr there's been a lot of looking at how do we figure out how can we have more people in a school who have access to this data that that takes all of these data points into consideration and not just you know push pulling certain levels so I think that's a really interesting um, perspective that you have on that from from the from the student perspective of who hears who hears looking at me based on all of my all of my data points, all of my achievements, mm -hmm. um, and not just you know what they want to look at in terms right. of what my record is. Um, so going forward, um, so you talked about zero zero tolerance and sort of the notion of once you got into a category, you couldn't sort of get out of that category. Um, what kind of policy recommendations would you make to the folks in this room or things that they should be thinking about and looking at um, that would have changed the experience that you had? Yeah, so uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, you know, this restorative practice model and I think definitely expanding that model and seeing how do we implement it within districts. Um, you know, I completely agree every state is different and they're going to, you know, respond to legislation differently. But we have to truly get down to the root of this whole discipline thing and how do we change that? Because right now what it's doing, whether we realize it or not, is it's really solidifying a student's status and it's for the rest of their academic career because it's going to go from with them from elementary school to middle school to high school, even to college. And they're going to see, okay, this is your academic record. Right. And why is that so important on an academic record? 
Now, you know, if a student has committed an egregious crime, I, you know, fully agree. It definitely should be, you know, notified to the school. But for small instances that are really based off of cultural differences and a misunderstanding, that shouldn't have to be the trajectory that that student will be placed on and it shouldn't influence how their future teachers will treat them. Right. And so really looking at how do we change that, and it's not saying that we have to overhaul the whole system, but we're seeing the negative consequences of it and it's only getting worse and worse and compounding. And so it's really up to us now to change that policy and also reevaluating the relationship between school police officers and the students in which they're sworn in to serve mm -hmm. and really enhancing that. So you mentioned this earlier, were you, did you ever have sort of discipline problems in school? I was never suspended. I was never got a referral, um, none of that. Interesting. So this, um, there, we have a question um, from someone, I don't know if it's online or in the room, were your teachers notified of your legal status? And if so, did you receive different treatment as a result of that? Uh, this is a really interesting question, right? <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, the first school I went to was one of the top 100 schools in America. Um, it, it was, you know, it's international baccalaureate program. And there, um, even when I got in trouble, to be honest, my teachers didn't care. Hmm. It, it wasn't until I was kicked out of that school and got rezoned for a different school that my communities and school site coordinator, prior to me coming in, connected with my teachers and kind of told them, hey, this kid's gonna be coming in, uh, here's some of his challenges, how can we support him? And so even when I was arrested my third time at that school, the level of welcome I got when I returned was so much more significant. And I will highlight that that school was, you know, uh, noted as like a poverty school or title uh, one, if you will, and was actually shut down. But it's very ironic for me that in the school that was under-resourced and seen as a bad school, I received so much more support, hmm. not just from the teachers, but even from the principal and school resource officer there than at the larger prestigious school where I was really just that number. And, they, and, and the teachers there were sort of like, that's not my problem. Exactly. That is sort of the feeling you got. Um, let's take another question um, here. Um, Let's see, you discussed your background and certain racial stereotypes. What um, should policy makers know about how stereotypes impact kids' educational experiences? It's a great way for us to sort of get into this race issue. Yeah, it influences their self-perception. And I don't think that we realize that. And that when we're telling them that you're this, you're this, you're this, uh, and they receive that message consistently, they start to believe it and it really becomes that self-fulfilling prophecy and then when they see how people with that same stereotype are treated when they're 10, 20, 15 years older, uh, they internalize that. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened with me because I was told I am the stereotype. I started in fact acting as I thought that stereotype should be the whole time, never <laughs> being from that background. Right. And that's what we see with a lot of uh, young people trying to fit in and especially when it comes to socialization and that we have to be very careful because that stereotype isn't just in an academic setting. It's going to transcend to every other category in their life. And that's very dangerous because they're still growing up and developing and finding themselves. And if they gravitate towards that, there's going to be a lot of negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really great advice. Um, what adv let's take one more. What advice would you give to, to the adults to help youth like yourself? Yeah, definitely. So I would say... Uh, you know, in Charlotte right now, they're uh, are talking a lot about social capital and what does that look like. And uh, we were just ranked 50th out of 50th in regards to upward economic mobility, meaning a young person born and poor in Charlotte is going to die poor and a young person born and rich in Charlotte is going to die even richer. And I think some simple things we can do are advocate, right, um, and seeing things through to the end. So if you're helping a young person, it's more than just sending an email on their behalf, but following up to make sure that it was actually um, fulfilled and they got the support that they needed. And we're not all, you know, boots on the ground, you know, I'm sure just like you know, we're busy people, um, but also connecting them to resources that are privileged to you and your network, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether it's through experiences or through exposure or, you know, it could be tickets to something that you can't make, right? Um, but we really have to um, think about how do we help them, not just socioeconomically, but really from that career standpoint. Because I believe this boils down to economics and that if a young person has access to develop skills to whether go to school or trade or career or military, they're not going to make 
the decisions that we yeah. unfortunately see a lot of young people making. So let's talk a little bit more about that because I'm I think that 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 notion of social capital is really really important. Um, th that it's not just how you score on your SAT or what even college you might get into or what you know um, certification program you go to. It's sort of the network of people that you know. Yeah. Right. So how did you navigate that? Yeah, so I was, um, to be honest, very fortunate to be embraced by communities and schools the way I was. And so um, I was volunteering and I'm meeting with board members who are, you know, senior leaders in corporations, or own their own companies. And so I was able to interact with people who, if I hadn't been a part of communities and schools, otherwise wouldn't have met. And they were able to write letters of recommendations. They were able to take me to events. Um, they were able to purchase professional items for me. And they were really able to not just show me, but teach me, um, you know, when I work with young people, say, you know, corporate talk. Mm -hmm. Because for a lot of young people, it's hard for them to code switch and understand what's professionally appropriate, what's socially, what's personally appropriate, and having them to show me that in their everyday lives. It wasn't a fake, oh, okay, I'm going to come, you know, take you and take pictures with you and show how much I helped. But, hey, it's a Saturday afternoon. I'm going out to, you know, this place. Let me show you how this is done. And so for me, that was really enlightening because, um, I hadn't experienced that before. Right. Do you, um, this is a slightly off topic, but do, do you, do you um, feel like you had in this sort of capacity that, and, and ever since I think it sounded like from about 17 or so, mm -hmm. did you have certain sort of mentors in your life that you were sort of like your go-to people when oh, you had yeah. questions about stuff like this? Definitely. I mean, I think mentors got me through it because um, academics was never the challenge mm -hmm. for me. It was always that personal side and having mentors who truly took me in, who not just, like I said, it wasn't just this for show thing, but right. it was this consistent, intentional relationship that now has developed over time and evolved. And so I think that's a key piece. You know, we talk a lot about mentorship and I'm very uh, cautious when using the word because from my experiences and understanding, mentorship is a lifetime commitment because you can't tell me right. you're gonna help me today and then in a year from now I reach out and you say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm too busy to speak with my assistant. Hey, it's, right. you know, so it's okay, you know, we can help and coach and guide and all of that. But when using the term specifically mentor, understanding that that is a lifetime commitment and you are family from that point. And right. with family, no matter how crazy they are. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a great piece of advice, I think, for those of us who are a little further along in our lives, um, that, that that word is not one that we should take lightly because you don't take it lightly. Very much so. Um, so that's really great advice. Um, so I've been asking you a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, do you have questions for this group? Do you have questions that you hope we go out and try to answer and solve based on what how this has all played out for you? I'm, I would like to know, um, at what point is it time to take action? Um, as a millennial, we've seen a lot of conversations, and they're great and they're needed, and I think because of our energy, you know, we're anxious to help, you know, change the world. But I'm curious, how do we move forward? You know, understanding that policy and legislation takes time and election cycles and all that, but for a young person, how can we take that action? Because we realize maybe you all can't, but there's things, whether it be grassroots or what have you, that we can do. And I think I would be curious to know what the audience's um, perspective on that is because um, we've seen a lot of conversations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what is action for you? What, 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 what would you say, there it is, I see it, there, it's happening? I think action would be the progressive attainment of a goal. And, and for you, that is, um, whether that's sort of in the town you live and work in now or nationally? I would say both. Yeah. Um, we're in a global society today. So to, for young people, we're not just thinking about our cities, or our towns, or our states, but looking at what are we doing and then how do we connect and leverage that with people from maybe halfway across the world. Right. Well, I think we are, I don't really know what time it is, but I think we're, um, we're, wrapping up and and I just I just want to have I want to just one other question for you which is again back to sort of this policy this notion of action that you just raised is sort of what level of leadership I mean so 
there's leadership at a school level, there's leadership at a community level, there's leadership at a state level, there's leadership at a, at a national level, and we've talked about those different levels of leadership a lot here today. So as, as you navigated this, this system that we've designed, you know, what level of leadership made the most difference for you? And, and so when you, when you want that action, where would you have us train all of our, you know, energy first? Yeah, I think, you know, it makes me think of the saying, all politics are local. Um, it was at that local level. Um, of course, it was supported from a national effort, but when I think about the people who made the biggest impact, um, it wasn't a president, it wasn't a CEO, you know, it wasn't a senator, it was, you know, Joe and Reggie and all the other folks. And so I think it's going to be those people who are closest um, to the population. However, they do need that national support because right. there is a lot of burnout in dealing with these issues. Right. So there is that connection that Secretary Duncan talked about, that, that, that there needs to be a philosophical um, direction set, even if that action is occurring locally. Um, but I think, you know, proximity matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I think that's, that's really interesting advice that, that you have for us. So I'm just going to close us out here and just point out that Jamal has, like, the coolest socks on. <laughs> and I think we have had, yes, those are awesome. We've had good socks all day today, I feel like. Uh, but I think you get the prize at the oh, moment. Thank so thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>